Okay, uh, we're continuing with uh, digital marketing analytics path to value part two. And we're on seven of the 12 paths of value <clears throat> or nuggets of value. And uh, <clears throat> digital party, third party data platforms. Well, we, we talk a little bit about the very third party things like the third party cookies and first party cookies. And the third party, there's a lot of tools that I know my students have access to at the uh, library at Baruch College, but many universities get free, I wouldn't say free, they get syndicated data uh, from a variety of places. And I know Baruch has <clears throat> probably um, a couple hundred different sources of data of which I've looked at all of them <clears throat> to some extent just to see which ones might be useful for the courses I teach. And I only found maybe <clears throat> 15 or 20 that I could envision using because many of them are being used for other things that um, don't particularly lend themselves to digital marketing. But of the ones that I could envision using and which I think businesses could envision using, ABI Inform Global, <clears throat> again, these are things are articles from trade journals and magazines um, that might be useful for research. <clears throat> Academic One File, again, more of the same. Business Monitor Online or BMI Research, uh, give you some information about a market of a particular area where you might want to do marketing too. Emarketer, I find, I used a lot in my book. <clears throat> Emarketer is like a publisher of uh, digital marketing. Let me just stop this for a second to clear my throat. You know, so Emarketer is a pretty good source of syndicated marketing data that comes from a lot of different sources that they put into charts, and they even let you make your own. Gartner is something that we get um, on the main page of the Baruch portal. And uh, it gives you analysis of the IT markets and hardware, software, IT services, and semiconductors, and so on. <clears throat> Be very useful. Roll your online is, uh, I guess, an encyclopedia. It's good for citations and paper writing. Ibis World was actually kind of interesting when I came across it. Ibis World is like a bunch of analysts that look at different segments of the market and they write analyst reports with SWOT analysis and charts and all that. It, they talk about seven different industries and the only problem I find with Ibis World is, is they do a lot of work for you, but some of the things that you might want a report on it, it just isn't one you know an analyst didn't look at it yet and you know also it maps up to various industry codes and so it might be interesting to look at these uh these things and i guess because the 700 plus industries uh that an analyst has looked at all the reports are on a very similar type of format so <clears throat> i think it could be a very useful tool depending on whether the, the data that you're wanting to look at, the industry you want to look at, and the, the information it's putting forward is, is useful to your marketing. I don't know that it always is, but it could be. Canopy is, uh, gives you stock educational videos, which may, may not be useful. American Fact Finder, well, I guess if you're in America, <clears throat> you can get demographic data against the zip code. And Business Insights Essential is good for SWOT analysis. Uh, Mintel Academic, well, that's, you know, and PIVCO obviously is something about private companies and financial filings. Simmons OneView for demographics, Statistica, like eMarketer, but has more, and WARC, um, resource with data for many marketing data trends and so on. So I found that, again, the question is, <clears throat> which one of these do you want to use? I mean, and so there's an assessment for that, a marketing research capabilities assessment. That's just one that I picked. Um, there may be others, you know, there may be other ways to look at this, but I figured that would be a good assessment. 
Um, and now we go to the social media analytics and content marketing that also happens to be a lot of what the Rutgers course is based on. When I created the social media for the arts course at Rutgers, and I've been updating it and delivering it since then, it, it was more for artists and creators at Mason Gross. Uh, it was a business school offering to help them market, but over time it's become more, much more than that. And uh, most of the people that take it at Rutgers are our students uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, and uh, and very very few of them are Mason Gross students. You know, uh, those who are studying music, dramatics, arts, and so on. Actually, I think the things that we talk about are of interest to pretty much everybody and are useful in almost any domain. So, the social media. We know that social media, now that we've gotten these other things that are in part of digital marketing, the question is, do we actually have the content and know how to use it properly? And so I felt like this one chapter really takes what I learned when I put together the course into a single hyper-focused lens. Do, do, we, do we actually understand what the content that we need to do, that we need to have is? And can we deliver it? Can we produce it? We know that majority of people are online, but we've already seen from the other paths of value that most of the, the, the actions happening, not on a website, but all over the web, and it's being collected by different platforms that are storing it in their own ways for their own purposes. You know, you've got Twitter analytics for Twitter, you've got cloud analytics, you've got Google analytics for blogs and websites, <clears throat> you've got Instagram analytics, and you've got YouTube analytics for YouTube, and you've got streaming media and its own analytics, and message board stats, and chat, ba chat bot analytics, and <clears throat> various other Facebook and other uh, social networks and LinkedIn has its own analytics and apps have its own analytics and data feeds and virtual reality probably going to have its own 3D heat maps and analytics and the question <clears throat> becomes okay how much of these can actually be layered since they're really not created for the same purposes and hey wait a second they're not even calling the same, they're not even exactly counting the same way because there's specific things that happen in each platform that are unique to that platform in the way they structure the experience. For example, follows and following on Twitter have a significance connected to that. Um, sharing may be universal across many of the social media platforms, but clearly um, Likes are counted in Facebook a certain way. Now there's more than just liking. You can like with an emotion as well. Uh, when we end pinning, for example, is pinning content on Pinterest. When we start like really thinking about the various metrics that are created by the platform vendors, we we come to the the painful truth that between the web analytics and the various other in-house data you have, and then you've got all this activity by all these different uh, platforms that some of them are very private about getting their data and others are like Twitter are able to kind of pretty much put it out there. It's just a matter of you getting it or buying a lot of it. <clears throat> you understand that you can't really put it all together. It's not even meant to go all together. And the attempt to put it all together it could be you know, almost useless and time consuming. Uh, and then you, oh, you know, I have all kinds of different <clears throat> analytics here that really aren't designed to go together very well with each other, no matter how you want to cut it. So the biggest thing we, we have to contend with at the business school and the various business courses is that uh, we have this business analytics data that we're used to and we teach a lot of courses on. Um, that works basically with structured data, you know, we have Cognos or some other tools, Salesforce, whatever, Oracle. It's got historical data, it's often private data that company has, it's, uh, uh, it's often happening in an intranet, not an internet. It's, uh, 
using proprietary data within the company. It's it's uniform and cleaned already pretty much. Uh, it's controlled. Uh, the, the, the company controls it. The organization controls it, and it and it's it's formalized. Then you have this social media and as social media analytics. It's 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 full of semi-structured, unstructured data. That it's not the data isn't uh, easy to understand really, or it's not organized in real time. It's it's being produced very quickly in a lot of cases. Uh, every second, every moment. It's a lot of it can be filtered in in public ways that scare a lot of people. Uh, it's not stored by you. It's uh, there isn't any way you can get all of it because it's like the air in a room. You can't, you know, or the air in 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 in, in the building or the air in New York. You can't get all of it. <clears throat> There's no way you can sample it, but you can't get all of it. There's so much of it, and it's it's all a hodgepodge. It's coming from everywhere, <clears throat> no matter how you try to isolate it, and. Um, it, the more you spread it around, I guess the more value it comes. The viral element, it's it's and 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 so it's a lot. It's gotten mixed with a lot of things that aren't business based. And so when you try to kind of mix these two together, <clears throat> you kind of almost realize that you need a whole different format to look at social media analytics and business analytics. And I think the attempts to try to treat social media analytics as business analytics have largely failed <clears throat> and it will fail <clears throat> because the data is of a different nature you need different tools different disciplines and often the attempt to create a data flow and a product out of social media analytics has failed as well because it is it, it isn't business analytics and it can't be used the same way and I think a lot of people and a lot of companies have failed to do this when they have tried to do it and many are failing to understand how different they really are <clears throat> they need a different approach <clears throat> but I have traced back the beginning of social media analytics at least to like 2003 I mean I know that because I came across vendors that were uh, like at the time collective intellect that was bought by Oracle you know maybe five or six years ago um, they were doing work for the CIA and other you know when first blogs when, as soon as you start having having blogs in <clears throat> and then eventually Twitter and and uh, forums and and so on you had data being produced by people all over the place and uh, you needed analytics and a lot of times the analytics would be created by the platforms <clears throat> for themselves and then made available to marketers or to research analysts um, who then try to aggregate it try to make sense of it but it didn't uh, <clears throat> as companies started realizing there was value in this data they thought okay well let's try to take it up a notch and uh, see if we can offer it as a product. That didn't work. Probably still doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> we, we can't look at it that way. And that's the big failure. However, my co-author, Gohar F. Khan, you know, really came up with this construct. It was something that I kind of was thinking of almost parallel to him, but he conceptualized it a little differently than I I, I conceptualized it as, as a rainbow layer cake and rainbow data, and he conceptualized it as seven layers of, uh, or seven lenses of social media analytics, which could be looked at individually, and I, I suppose combined. <clears throat> but uh, you probably want to look at them individually and then combine them. Um, networks, text, actions, which, which we call intermediate metrics, hyperlinks, locations, search engines, and apps. <clears throat> I mean, that's what he came up with. And here's an explanation of each of them. I think a lot of them are self-explanatory. Um, and then he came up with uh, platforms, which he talked about in his first book, on which we built on on this book. Uh, you know, which I, again, actions are intermediate metrics. So we were looking at 
<clears throat> various tools that would be looking at layers of data. So we could cut apart, you know, social media analytics and this unstructured, unstructured and semi-structured data and look at it that way. And <clears throat> we could get more out of it if we did. Uh, and then we could do an assessment on it. Um, what we call a social media analytics vendor assessment. I just uh, made up, uh, these are real vendors, but I, I don't mean that these, this was a real in-depth assessment. And uh, <clears throat> it, it just basically is an attempt to say, when I understand my needs as an organization, which vendor would be best for me? And a lot of cases you'll be looking at, vendors are pretty important because they're not equivalent. <clears throat> Even though a lot of them are offering similar things, there's enough difference in the vendors that, and that the business process that you have in your organization or as an individual, it, it may make a big difference which one of these you get even today, you know. And so you really do have to look at them because it, it isn't plug and play. It isn't like that. And anyone who says it is, it's, it's not. And, and you know, um, when we did this at the social media for the arts course, we have an assessment where students measure their own presence. I have my own assessment, similar to Radar Chart, where we use public APIs to look at eight different social media channels. And here's a, a student who's assessing their own presence in social media on these eight different channels at the beginning of the semester. And then we look at the end of the semester, four months later, and we see that in this case, the student grew in their Facebook page and they grew in their online video, YouTube. <clears throat> they, they grew and they can measure that not by their opinion, but by actual metrics that were pulled from the third party platform. And so I wanted students to see their own progress. And that's why we did the online presence success assessment, which I call the analytic selfie. <clears throat> Now we go to the ninth nugget of wisdom or path of value called text analytics and algorithmic curation. Now, I created this course at Baruch because I, I attend a lot of uh, conferences from, on text analytics over the years, the Sentiment Analysis Symposium. I, I've used text analytics tools. I'm not a data scientist, but <clears throat> I created a course around that and I integrated it into the book um, and Gohar had some material too so it was somewhat challenging to put the two together and figure out where everything fit uh, which was my job as the lead author and the main contributor to the book <clears throat> so I you know basically well you know having said that the text analytics really goes with the assumption that we're going to take uh, textual information and ultimately more than text. We could take vision uh, images and sound <clears throat> and turn it into some sort of numerical table that we can then run mathematical and algorithmic operations, regressions, classifications, and neural networks on, Bayesian equations on. <clears throat> because we have so much textual data then we can't read it all obviously we're creating so much information and we, you know the same algorithms that are used in text analytics are really adapted from other forms of statistical analysis and big data <clears throat> so you know the problem with text analytics if, if it's a problem is that uh, I liken it to uh, you know I love eggs and bacon and uh, for breakfast <clears throat> and a lot of times you don't have time for eggs and bacon so you open up a packet of instant breakfast and pour it in and it, it, it says on the package it's it's equivalent to eggs and bacon <clears throat> but it's not eggs and bacon and you know but it, it supposedly you're getting the same thing <clears throat> question is if you took eggs and bacon and you pulverize them into ash and then put strawberry flavoring in it and uh, mix it in with some milk. <clears throat> uh, is it the same thing as bullseye's eggs with bacon and hash browns? And oh, I don't think anybody in their right mind would say it would be. <clears throat> but you know, maybe to the body, maybe. <clears throat> but uh, the, the the issue is, is that the transformation of data into something that can be used in an equation in itself 
means you've got to do a lot to the information. And uh, <clears throat> it allows you to do a lot of things with the textual information and then the other types we mentioned that you wouldn't, you know, it can be very amazing and interesting if you spend the time to do it. But obviously in the process of doing it, you're losing something. <laughs> you're using a lot of what made the thing interesting in the first place. The eggs and bacon taste like eggs and bacon. And when you turn it into <clears throat> strawberry uh, breakfast milkshake, it's not the same thing anymore. And uh, even to do it well, you need specialists and understand. Even though there are third-party platforms that you can buy, you know, that kind of <clears throat> do a lot of this stuff for you and just let a knowledge worker kind of work on Boolean queries. But they don't work that well, and they're not that customizable for all intents and purposes. Businesses, as we know, really they're, they 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 thrive on on differentiation and every business needs to hyper target identify and target what they're doing right and what they need so the plug and play text analytics tools just aren't useful for that no matter how they're plugged and the ones that do exist are largely for social media which is actually one of the worst use cases for text analytics that exists <clears throat> For a lot of reasons, which I'll cover in this uh, section, but uh, the market's growing. It's not going to be a super big one, but by 2020, it's forecast to be six, four, and five billion. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the industries there could be very useful: consumer goods, banking, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, government, and uh, in North America, it's, uh, it's well, it's big everywhere. But again, you need specialists. And uh, a lot of times, like all the other analytics paths of value, you need a up-to-speed knowledge worker, which is what we work on at Zicklin and at what I work on at Rutgers. I mean, it's getting people to the point they can actually understand these tools enough to be able to conceptualize how they can adapt them to business. And that was what the book really was for and what my courses really are for. We're not teaching uh, most of our students to do text analytics literally because most of them don't have the data analytics skills. But many business, um, <clears throat> many students in business schools, much less the other schools at, at, at Zicklin and at Rutgers, <clears throat> you need to understand these tools. And in the case when they're hiring manager, they need to understand when they need to bring people in who can do them. And so they need to evaluate the platforms and evaluate what they're looking at. And obviously, as I mentioned, there's a number of use cases, the ways you can use it. <clears throat> and obviously, we're there's a couple of basic things that text analytics is used for, which is uh, sentiment, <clears throat> whether it's positive, negative, neutral, we're looking for trends. Um, uh, forecasting where things are going, intention mining, going in and concept mining. And I think I define that pretty well in the book, so I'm not going to really, you know, these are kind of high-end kind of things that we could spend a lot of time talking about. I'm just going to say that, you know, we cover that in a, in a chapter that's fairly in-depth. And But in order to use text analytics, you often have to transform it and uh, a traditional data analytics uh, paradigm is to um, <clears throat> take data out of the files or the format it is and rewrite it in a format where you can integrate it with the other data you have, <clears throat> whether it's customer relationship management, flat files, enterprise resource reporting, and you need to stick it into a data warehouse and these days now into a data lake or a cloud database. <clears throat> so in order to do that, a lot of times what we'll do is ETL or extract transfer load, which is taking information in one format, examining it, rewriting it, and storing it in a different format, and maybe adding some additional data fields to it. And uh, usually that's a custom program that a programmer does, and you know what you need to do. The text analytics uh, operations uh, are to group textual data once we've transformed it into something that we can operate on, run decision trees, logistic regression, and cluster it up 
these are things that are useful for not a lot of different types of data, not just text analytics, but we use them in text analytics. And you know, one way would be is to use unassisted learning to just throw in a lot of data um, and have it cluster up. In this case, we're looking at debt and income. We use a very common algorithm called k-means, um, which just kind of picks a bunch of data and comes up with k number of clusters that are different enough that they they can be looked at as clusters. They organize around, and it's ir ir iterative, I guess, or iterative. It it goes to a point when you can't get more any more clusters that are useful or different enough. And the problem with k-means, it does take a while to run, so it, it's integrated in data pro, in data analytics and uh, um, big data, but often it's a part of an operation that with many other algorithms. It, in and of itself, it may not be quick enough for many of the operations at a real time. Another thing we have is supervised learning, which is a more commonly used, <clears throat> where we're trying to really understand, uh, we've created a couple, we've trained an algorithm to understand basic patterns, and then we let it run on the rest of the data. So um, these, these uh, supervised learning is we have a human trader, trainer that's training uh, algorithm to understand uh, um, that's something that's red and big and has an oval shape, it's probably an apple, and we train it <clears throat> various ways to do that, and something else might be a cherry or banana or grape, and if w the, these uh, algorithms, supervised learning algorithms, they need to be trained very specifically for the kind of data that they're going to be operating on. So if you're going to have a vision um, optimized uh, uh, training algorithm for counting what's in a refrigerator uh, and, uh, and that works pretty well once you've trained it you can just let it r roll and it kind of figures out what's in there and counts it for you then if you put that into the space shuttle and you kind of look at the things in there it's not going to work that well and so the, the big learning here is that you can't um, that uh, supervised learning only works for very specific types of things it's being trained for and if you use it for something else or a different data set that's kind of different things it's not going to work very well um, <clears throat> so really what we come up with here is that uh, text analytics and various other offshoots of text analytics are best used where where business actually has a very clear idea what they need to to get at and there's a lot of data to look at and they you know want to kind of data mine that data so that doesn't always exist in an organization but what I wanted to create a course that lets students know that these these things were possible to do there's a lot of businesses where there's a lot of data sitting around that people don't realize could be analyzed this way and so I wanted to create a fairly good chapter on how to do that um, I also created a chapter, which Gohar also created his chapters on mobile analytics. Uh, I didn't really, I don't think our chapter on mobile analytics may be as deep enough as I would have liked it to have been. Um, you know, for, we're generating so much data from our mobile devices. We're actually doing more with mobile devices these days than we're doing on our laptops and desktops. And, you know, pretty much everything's, mobile now. We're, we're taking our whole lives with us in our pocket and that phone is becoming a a 3D pixel just like a web analytics pixel that's following us all around and we're pulling things and doing things on demand. So to, and certainly even search engines have recognized this because um, you know mobile uh, the fact that your website will render well in a mobile mobile environment in a mobile phone um, is a ranking factor now and it, it was starting 2015 uh, and we also know that people tend to when they do searches on mobile devices they tend to uh, be ready to take action on those things and that the same can't be said on desktops and laptops um, so um, and a lot of it's very location based because often they're searching for something nearby them so that even makes it more 
imperative that we understand mobile and and uh, that might be more important than a lot of other things we spend our time with um, so we know all these things and there's an assessment for that the, this assessment just looks at whether it makes sense to <clears throat> develop a specific uh, customized app or whether you should just make your site mobile friendly you know, or do some kind of hybrid where you create a user development platform that you can make customized versions of your app for different platforms, mobile platforms such as Android or iOS, you know, or, you know, and so on. <clears throat> um, there's pros and cons, so there's an assessment to just to ask you a bunch of questions. We have another one, <clears throat> you know, from a marketing perspective when you're targeting uh, your, your your advertising and your marketing messages to mobile devices, which you can increasingly do in Google and uh, Bing and other advertising platforms, or, or do you really set up for that? Do you understand how to leverage that? Do you really understand the best way to use those platforms? Do you have the staff to do it? So we have an assessment for that. Um, and that tells you where you're at. And then based on doing these assessments, you understand what you need to do. Another thing we have is the geolocation analytics, which I, for a long time, I spent a lot of time on exploring this, but I think with these phones, we got to see that they're collecting all this data that's evolved with where we are, and Google knows, and AT&T, and all the ISPs know exactly where we are most of the time, what we're doing, and a lot of times we're posting what we're looking at on Instagram or on uh, Snapchat or any uh, uh, number of other platforms. So, and a lot of stays public. Not all of Snapchat, but a lot of the other data is public, and can, and and in some cases can be filtered. But it's certainly <clears throat> this data being more behavioral, as you can see by this chart, is from is actually probably the most valuable data of all. That's a third-party data. That is that's data that's being collected and is incredibly useful as a marker of and, and it can even be gotten down to the individual account level so you can find a, a, a social media handle uh, because they're posting um, you know what they're looking at a lot of times when it's an image you know you know what they like by looking at all the images they post you know so much um, you know, the, the, the challenge is putting this data together. And now the device itself is giving you a lot of um, metrics that are customized to a mobile device like click to call, click to share, uh, click to drive, mobile coupons, Bluetooth, you have the iBeacon, um, touch sensors, augmented reality, and so on. And then you've got the XYZ axis. As you see, you've got a lot to think about here as a mobile marketer, as a mobile analyst. Um, you know, it's all blurring now, so we really do need to have a better idea about that. The locational data can be it can be incredibly precise in terms of location. I think um, GPS can be up to 20 feet. Uh, I beacons could be up to a couple of feet. Um, we can use near field communications, which never really fully took off um, to create little like bubbles of 150 feet that uh, you can uh, send messages to. You know, again, the iBeacons became very popular. I don't really have an assessment for <clears throat> this aspect because I just didn't find a good one. Um, so I won't say that I closed the circle on everything. I, I, I certainly, there's more I, I think we wanted to do. We did as much as we could humanly do. Um, but I think this is a field that's so gigantically important and large that there's no way to totally get everything. And I think as hard as we tried, you know, I don't think we covered everything we could have covered, but we I think we covered more and more in depth than anyone else. And then lastly, we have the integrating digital marketing analytics with business analytics, which was actually something that Gohar looked more at than, than I did. Um, <clears throat> coming from uh, more of the East, uh, 
more. Uh, here's a yin yang diagram of social media and business goals as yin and yang. <clears throat> I think that it can be looked at, and it's not just social media, it's just data, but it just happens to have social media and business goals here. I think you can get these to be complementary, I think, and to work for, you know, the idea of yin yang is that these things are chasing one another, they're rotating. I think you can get this to work. Um, and so Gohar had envisioned these again in its layers, um, which I think is very useful, something I really admired and something made me feel I wanted to have him as my co-author. <clears throat> because he, he had actually thought about this, that depending on what your business question is, you might want to look at a different layer here. Like in other words, if you're social media, if you're looking at social media, and you want to understand the polarity of it, you'd probably want to look at text analytics. You wouldn't look at web analytics because that wouldn't be appropriate. Web analytics doesn't capture that kind of information. You know, you, you, in other words, so first you would look at the right layer, then ultimately you've got to find the right vendor or the right tool, platform to or create your own. So, but at least he had thought about that. We could quabble that, you know, maybe Hyperlink analytics really should just be part of search engine analytics because most of the hyperlinks are, you know, really resulting from people to coming to and from. But you also have hyperlinks on sites in general. It's part of the W3C um, format. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee came up with in I think what the 1989 or that predated the web and the idea that <clears throat> we have all this linked resources together. You know, we, you know, search engines and social media grew on top of all that stuff, you know, and GPS solved the location issue and now I beacons and, uh, and NFC on top of that. So <clears throat> what we have is a lot of different ways we can get data now. The question is what data do we need? The social media analytics alignment metrics tries to look at, again, this is Gohar put this together, um, whether the things that you're doing in social media or any other kind of media outside of your business metrics, how well it's aligned with um, your business strategy and, and the resources that you have. You know, obviously you want to be in the upper right quadrant, but that's not always possible. Uh, and then my contribution in this chapter was coming up with this kind of nutshell thing that I make my students go through because I'd like to see everything in, like a, in a nutshell in the picture. Like if you're going to put together any kind of strategy, uh, put together your goals and how you're going to do it. Like I'd like to see everything you're going to do as one sheet where you can just look at it and say, OK, you know, maybe you could have several of these depending on what your initiatives are um, and just fill that out. Um, so the summary is what we've put together here is, I think, something that you, you can take this and bring it to almost any course at a business school. In almost any business, you could take this book, um, the book that I talk about at the very beginning here, you could take all of these things and really train your people 100% um, to be more effective with, with data. I mean. Um, with the resources we give you in the book. And, and honestly, you know, again, I would say go to uh, uh, one of these pages here. If you go to Amazon, uh, let's see if we can bring this up. Uh, and this will bring it up in Edge. You can see uh, the Digital Analytics for Marketing book. Um, I don't think we've got any reviews yet because it's a textbook. You can also get it through the Rutledge page. Um, which will kind of probably bring up my Rutledge page, um, where that's coming up from. Uh, I don't actually know if that's coming up in, in, in Rutledge, but uh, you can see the Rutledge uh, site, uh, the publisher, um, and you can order it directly from Rutledge. You know, and if you're an educator, you might be able to get a free copy as well. And for companies, I think, uh, it's possible potentially if you're doing corporate educational training to get the resources that we have in the educational guide because we have several. Um, so that's the talk today. I urge you all 
to go out if you're so inclined and get a copy of the book. Um, um, I would probably get the paperback and maybe I would uh, opt uh, for the digital version depending. Maybe I would get both because um, you could do some things with the digital version that you know are more convenient. If you don't want to have a lot of books, that's the way to go <coughs> on Kindle or you know another reader. And I leave you with that. Uh, so there's a lot we have put out today, and I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and uh, have a great day and a great learning experience with digital analytics and all the different paths of value we give you. Cheers!